Um, I'm now going to introduce Dr. Scott Shreve, who's a board-certified emergency medicine physician actively involved in design and development of healthcare technologies that improve the delivery of care and enhance quality of life. He's currently serving as the chief executive officer of Crossover Health, a next-generation healthcare delivery and management services company. Scott. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, this is a healthcare conference. We've been here about an hour, so I'm gonna have all you guys stand up really quickly, a little stretch. And uh, this also gives the opportunity for those poor souls sitting in the aisles to slide over without embarrassing yourself. So uh, come on in while we get settled. I'm a Mac guy, so I gotta switch over and cause havoc so you guys can sit down now if you're, if you're comfortable. So let's see if this works here. All right, okay. So uh, I'll just give a quick little introduction. I was a econ zoology undergrad. And so uh, instead of uh, managing a zoo, I ran off with the circus, which is emergency medicine. And so I had a great time in the ER, but since then I've uh, gone on to do some other things. So what I wanted to talk about today, uh, you're gonna hear a lot of great presentations, gonna be a lot of things that uh, will be shared with you today. You probably won't remember everything, but I hope you remember this one story. In 1980, a icon of Americana, the zoo, or the circus, excuse me, was in trouble. It had become bloated, it was obese, it was sclerotic, and it was essentially in the entertainment ICU. Um, the, the cost, the venues, the food wasn't very good, there was concern about animal treatment, and uh, it was in trouble. And it was, uh, it was looking like it was going towards oblivion. However, there was a group of performers that said, we can change this, we can do this better. There's things that we can remove, there's things that we can add, and we think we can reinvent how the circus works. We can create a brand new experience. And in fact, they did. They took certain elements of the circus experience and removed them. It was unheard of to get rid of the animals, to get rid of the ringleader, to have multiple themes, to have multiple venues, but they did it. They also added new features that radically changed the experience. And many of you have benefited and been and participated in Cirque du Soleil throughout the world. Is that by slightly changing certain things, the experience, refocusing on who is at the center of that, making it all about the, the experience for the people who are attending, removing costly elements, they were fundamentally able to introduce a new innovation that really changed the dynamics and recreated the circus. I think that's a great metaphor for what this whole conference is all about. Disruptive innovation, we've all benefited, as we heard this morning, about big data and technology and all these great things that are truly changing the world. Uh, we've benefited from incremental sustaining innovations as the features and functions of products that we use get better and better over time. But there's a little bit of an underside to that story of innovation, um, is that the performance level of some of the innovations sometimes exceed the capacity of consumers to use. You guys have all experienced this. I don't need my DVR recorder to control my air conditioner, which controls the microwave. That is too complex for me. I want the single button company that does exactly what I want when I want it. And what happens is there's companies like that. So when the single button company comes along that makes my life super easy to record the things I want, then I start to use that. What's fascinating about that innovation is often that same company, the single button company, that's all they do to start with but they start to gain market share. People start to adopt it because it begins to meet a need that people have. Meanwhile, the incumbents are wondering, I can't understand. I'm looking at the features and functions of all this crazy stuff I do, and yet people want the single button. What happened? What they forgot was is that people are looking for simplicity, seamlessness, integration, convenience, and that when those innovations are introduced, they can fundamentally transform industries, they create new markets, create a wealth of opportunities in multiple dimensions. And in those settings, I think new entrants have an opportunity to come in and change things and create things that are special and unique. 
I think this is a, also a great metaphor for this conference and what we're talking about in healthcare. We live in the greatest health system in the world. We have the best physicians, the best hospitals, the best diagnostics, the best equipment, the best genomic gene splicing, whatever de jure of the day. And it's awesome, and it's great. But I wonder if we haven't somewhat over function some of the stuff that we're doing. That in that same setting of all this incredible innovation, we have people dying. We are in an obesity epidemic. Diabetes is everywhere. We have people who are suffering tremendously from mental health disorders, depression, anxiety, ADHD, all kinds of situations. And yet in a world that is becoming more and increasingly connected, we have more and more people disconnected from their health from feeling like they belong to something that can take care of them and be a part of them and encourage them forward. And I think in that setting, you know, we have some opportunities. I don't need to spend any time on this curve for the people in this room. You guys all know this. This is incredible, actually, that over the years, that were just unsustaining, unrelenting cost increases. And what are we actually getting for all that? Our scores, our quality metrics, the things that we're doing, the health of our nation has not really improved very much. And in fact, we have all the issues I just mentioned. Now, I don't mean to paint this doom and gloom picture, because there is a lot of great things happening as well. And there are tons of people who are innovating their way out of this situation. Not just in a sustaining way, but in a disruptive way. Introducing new concepts, new payment models, new care delivery models, new technologies, uh, in, uh, integrating things in new combinations that are really starting to create a new day, a new opportunity for what we're doing. So my opportunity today is to introduce Crossover Health um, and also to introduce our industry. We are a medical group that provides primary health to large self-insured employers. We work directly with the employers to be paid. Uh, we don't accept insurance payments. And in that setting, we have a new set of opportunities uh, that are unique to us. We don't just provide care on corporate campuses or near campuses. We also provide care beyond those four walls. So our members, as they go into the network, we also provide advisory services to them. We direct them to the best specialist, to the networks that exist for that employer. We actually refer them to centers of excellence. We incorporate reference pricing and other tools that employers are beginning to use to guide them, given the trusted relationship we establish as part of their primary care providers. Now, we're not just doing this because it's cool and convenient for the, the, uh, the patients or the members of the employees. We're doing this because employers are demanding something different. That the employer, who probably has the most incentive to take care of individual people, to make sure they're creative, productive, happy in their work and life and progressing so that they can contribute the most to the company, they're doing this because they want reduced cost, they want better quality, and they want an experience for their members that engages them, that retains them, that keeps them productive and part of their teams. Um, just a little background on us quickly. We're based here in Lisa Viejo. We're local. Uh, we're funded by Norwest Venture Partners. Our practice model, as I mentioned, is to manage not just clinics, but the populations of these employers uh, wherever their patients are. Uh, we're paid directly by them. Uh, we have just over 250 employees. We're currently operating 12 centers from coast to coast. Uh, multiple geographies, and our focus has always been on this phenomenal patient experience. Uh, if you look at what we're actually doing, we provide primary health, which is the typical primary care that you would expect. Uh, we take care of urgent matters, routine matters, chronic matters. Our physicians are on call 24 seven. We're focused on the patient-centered medical home. We believe, though, primary health goes beyond just the doctor and the nurse, that it should include other specialists like physical therapy, Cairo, ACU, that it should include mental health, coaches, fitness specialists, and others that actually round out our comprehensive care model. And as I mentioned, we also get involved with what we call secondary care, which is risk stratifying populations, identifying people that we can actually intervene on, building a relationship with them, guiding them in the network, uh, and helping them be successful in their the different care programs that they're involved with. We're very fortunate to work with some amazing companies, companies that are innovators in their own space, that are changing the world, that their software is eating the world, as was described earlier. Uh, these folks are in a talent war. They are in a very tight competitive war for costs. And so they're looking at multiple ways to, to solve those problems. 
just to give you a sense of scale and scope of what Crossover is doing, in the last year we did over 134,000 uh, visits. We currently are taking care of about 30,000 patients. Um, of the visits we do, about 83% of every of, of the 10 appointments, 8.3 appointments are filled. It's highly utilized. Patients love the service. They love the convenience. They love the access. They love having time with a doctor to delve into the problems that they have. Our net promoter scores are over 80%. About 60% of the people who come in to see us want to establish care with us as their primary medical home. And we use a variety of technology and tools, which we'll talk about, that allow us to be efficient at this level of scale. We're doing 140,000 online appointments during the last 12 months, 106,000 messages back and forth between providers and patients to really engage this. Now, these numbers might not be impressive to some of the large groups that are here in the room, but they are the beginning of the, up the, up the curve, the disruption, to really have an impact. So what are we actually doing? How are we having this kind of impact? What is, what's going on here? What we did, our innovation, one was to get a different payment model. We went directly to the employers, in this case, who have a different set of expectations for what they want for their providers, the time they want with their patients, their members, the type of work they want us to do, the range of what they want us to do. And in that setting, we had an opportunity to innovate quite a bit. We, in turn, focused on creating an exceptional patient experience where our patients are greeted 95% of the time within five minutes and roomed, that they have 30 to 60 minutes with their physician, that there's a wide range of care services available right there. We perform laboratory services on site. We dispense medications on site and so forth. Um, this engagement, when you get that many people starting to utilize the services across this, creates a sense of membership or ownership or accountability. What our doctors are trying to do, because they have time to do it, is to establish a relationship to help individuals become accountable for their own care and in that little micro setting of that one-on-one -on -one, that they're able to actually uh, make some choices and decisions to improve health. And we're doing this because we think creating that exceptional experience leads directly to very positive and substantial health outcomes. So let me talk a little bit about how we do that. And again, I'm doing this, I'm sharing the crossover experience uh, to set the context for what this employer-directed primary care medical groups throughout the country are starting to do. So at Crossover, when we try to create this, as everyone thinks about the doctor as a care delivery, right? And that's important. The care model that we use, uh, which I'll talk about, is enabled by technology. But there are several other parts to this model that are equally important. What the brand strategy is, how we communicate what the service is, what the facilities look like, how do we manage people's health, not only within our clinic, but outside, and ultimately, what does membership mean to people? So let me walk you through a couple of these features kind of one by one so you get a feel for this. Every time we go into a new client setting, we help them think about how are you marketing this? How do you talk about this? What's the experience people expect when they walk in through this, uh, these four walls? We spend a lot of time with brand strategy because brand to us isn't cool logos and icons and nice colors. Brand is a commitment, it's a promise. It's the experience that you can generate. It's what people feel when they walk in. It's how they feel treated. It's, it's what enables them to identify consistently with what you're trying to do. So as we walk in, we help create new brands for our clients, whether that's at Facebook, designing a clinic that fits them, which is steel and wood and, and graffiti on the walls, or when we're at Apple, which is just like the Apple stores. It's crisp, it's clean, it's seamless. Um, and we, we tag them to do that. And here's some examples of that. So the facility design is actually important. We're not just building pretty offices that look nice. We're building offices that are totally redesigned. We don't have a waiting room. We don't need one. No one should need a waiting room. We got rid of that. We don't have charts in the back. They're all in the cloud. Our patients, when they come in, they get right back to the room. We can perform tests right on site. We can take care of them, spend time with them, refer them, warm handoffs to the physical therapists and others. And that's all because of the way we design the facilities. Our entire care team sits together because we collaborate. We work together. And in that setting, the coordination is seamless and very helpful for the patients. So facility design has become an interesting differentiator for a medical group. Who knew that a medical group would get involved with this facility design? Our care model I talked about briefly, it's 24-7, 365. Our physicians are available to take call, to guide our patients wherever they are. People don't get sick just from 8 to 5. 
Uh, we spend a lot of time about centering the care on the patient because when we, we, we put the patient first, uh, we feel we get to the right decisions. We don't schedule conveniently for the doctors. We schedule conveniently for the patients. We change how, um, how the interactions work up front when you check in, when you check out, and, and make that seamless for the patient. We spend a lot of time with workflows, with handoffs, with how we're going to coordinate with the specialists. Because all that friction is so much of the irritation that prevents people from engaging in their help. We also use quite a bit of enabling technology. I'm not just talking about electronic health records, which are used to document and to bill and to order. I'm talking about patient engagement technology. How does a patient access us? We heard earlier about the millennials. You know, 70% of what they do is on the phone. So I can't, you know, have a paper-based chart when they show up. So we're actually, all of our check-ins are, are online. Um, you can come in and it's within two minutes you can check in using the iPad. You can pay your bill online. We store your credit card. We, we can charge right away from there. Uh, we can schedule. You can message. You can get your results. You can track and trend your, your health plan over time, your care plan over time. And this technology is something that we had to create because it didn't exist. And again, who thought a medical group would be designing technology? Um, but we had to. The other thing is, again, we're not just taking care of patients as they come to see us that day. We're taking care of a population. So we're thinking more broadly, and that requires data. So in the setting in which we practice, normally as a physician, I got all I have is my own electronic health record and a bunch of faxes that are coming in from everybody else, maybe some labs. Now I'm getting claims data, biometrics, health screening data, my own data, specialist data, and all of it's coming into a single database that we can then mine and interact and make uh, decisions based on that. So we provide care outside the four walls of our facilities as well. The patients, they love this. They love the service. They love the access. They love the, the relationship. Our physicians are on call 24-7. We're initially a little nervous about that. I mean, how much, how much call are they going to get? It turns out if you make call available, if you have tools that patients can access, know they can access the doctor, they don't end up needing to call us that often. And when they do call us, we're there for them. We help guide them and steer them, and they love it. I love that. This is a word. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but you know, it's, these are about 1,000 surveys. The words that appear most frequently are largest. And so I love to see great, awesome experience. And again, just some more satisfaction scores over the last couple of years. So this particular site has grown 10x since we started. We started with 700 employees. Now they have 7,000 in three and a half years. The scores have stayed exactly the same over that time. This is that same group. This is the number of visits that they conduct every month and every quarter. As it's scaled, you know, it's grown about 77% the last uh, year. Um, but people are obviously adopting the service. They like it. What's interesting is this isn't just like urgent care come in because it's convenient. This is people establishing relationship and coming back again and again as needed for different services um, to help them reach their health goals. So cool, I get it. It's a great experience. It looks nice. It's convenient. It's accessible. So what's the deal? Where, where is the beef? Well, here you start to begin to see this. What we've started to do now, so we've gotten more sophisticated, is to do risk-adjusted cohort analysis. So we'll take populations that use the center versus those that don't. We risk-adjust those to make sure we're, we're comparing apples to apples, and we can begin to look at the results. So in terms of the scope of services, we offer something much broader than what's offered in the community. The average wait time to get an appointment is less than a day. The average wait time when you show up is less than five minutes, 30 to 60 minute appointments. Um, our referral rate, because of the time and the relationship, our referral rate is less. There's no incentive for our physicians to refer more or less. They refer less when there's time to address issues. Our net promoter scores have always been in the high, uh, above 80%, which again, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that score, but a phenomenal, a great score is above 50%, meaning, uh, uh, that more than 50% of the people give you a 9 or a 10 that they would refer you to a friend. So we have 84% of people saying that. Um, we also are spending 28% less on cohort ad risk-adjusted cohorts. What are we doing that's driving that down? Well, it turns out that that patient experience has a big impact. Our providers also treat differently in that setting, and our prescription costs are 44% less as well. So what's cool about this is, is that I love is what we like to say is that the savings that you're achieving should fund the innovation you're trying to implement. And so here's what we did to, to look at that. 
If you take a cohort of community users versus crossover health, you can see what the numbers are there in the two left columns. But then we said, well, what if we took our same cohort? Let's compare apples to apples. What if we sent that same cohort? We just threw them out into the original or the, or the typical network. And you can see that even when we add all of our OPEX, all of our spending, everything to burden our model, it's actually cheaper to do what we're doing at the level we're doing, at the quality we're doing, at the experience level we're creating than it is to send them out into the network. We're pretty pleased with those results, and we feel like we're just starting. Which ties me back a little bit to my original thesis. The argument that we're making and the industry that we're introducing to this group is that employers are really trying to take charge of their healthcare spending. It's been a real problem for them. It's affecting their competitiveness. And the innovation, the disruption that they're funding is at the very bottom of the food chain where no one's paying attention. We all this great stuff at the top of the food chain, but no one's paying attention to care delivery. Turns out that if I can build a relationship with these patients, they'll take my recommendations 95% of the time. And I can refer them to the best specialist, the right specialist at the right time, and be there for them as they go throughout their journey and have a tremendous impact on cost. The thesis was, can you invest in primary health and therefore reduce the rest of the overall spend? And we're just beginning to prove that out. So let's tie it back to where we started. So what's the mystery? Where's the magic? And let me summarize those in three bullet points. If you think about this model, this concept as a disruption, we bet that creating a phenomenal patient experience could change the game. And we've seen incredible utilization, penetration, and adoption numbers. And that's been our personal triple aim. Uh, patient satisfaction has been phenomenal despite massive growth in the size that we're, uh, the people are taking care of. We have a physical or primary health model, which is physician-led comprehensive primary care, integrated with all these other specialists, delivered on-site, worksite, or virtually as needed. And our risk-adjusted cohorts are achieving a 30% cost savings. We're just getting into, with some of our more advanced clients, secondary care, where we add another layer of service on top, which is now guiding our members who trust us, who know us, who use our services, out into the network to guide them to the best specialists, the best facilities, the best diagnostics, and to help them uh, achieve success there. Because we have the data, we can also now create special programs. When we saw that sleep, uh, sleep studies were an incredible anomaly in terms of cost, we hired our own sleep specialist to provide the care and steer them as they go into these secondary services. When we saw that dermatology visits were exceptionally long to get into and difficult to obtain, we hired a dermatologist who now begins to see patients. So we can now start to intervene in that way. Once the, once the platform of primary care is established, we can do all these other types of interventions. And again, the, the whole thesis of can you create an experience and can that experience result in legitimate outcomes that are differentiated that can fund this whole model? And we feel like we've been able to pr prove that thesis. And at the end of the day, we feel like we're just getting started this sector, this industry, the others who are like us who are innovating in this way are just getting started as well. And uh, we hope that you will join us in the journey as we uh, work to slay the uh, healthcare dragon. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>